Good afternoon, beautiful people, and Happy New Year. I want to wish each and every one of you a wonderful and the best of everything this year as the days and months uh, come and go. And today I'm so thrilled to have Andrea Barton Rees as my guest at the round table. She is the CEO of the Paid Family and Medical Leave Insurance Authority here in Connecticut. And as you know the format, you would get to know more about Andrea as we go ahead. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Happy New Year. Same to you. Now, you and I know we've been through some tough times in the last 18 months. A lot of changes occurring in our li individual lives as well as you know in our communities and globally. Um, would you like to share some thoughts on that? I would. We've heard the word unprecedented used so many times, perhaps overused to, to, according to some, but I also like to think of this time as really indescribable in most of our lifetimes. And it's called on us to be more adaptable than we've ever been. And we've seen the spectrum of adaptability that some people have. And we've also seen a lot of the inequities that we know exist in, in our country and, and in our society really become much more prominent and brought much more to the forefront with the onset of COVID. So those who were really living on the financial edges of their lives found that there was a precipice that they always knew existed. And those of us who worked in social services knew existed, but we watched millions of people fall into that precipice right. uh, through either a lack of, of access to appropriate health care, education, and child care. So it's, it has really brought into sharp relief what we need as a nation in order to be strengthened uh, across the board. And then there's been a lot of debate as to actually how that will occur. So I agree with you completely. We have really seen just extraordinary times and, and not in the best way. I agree with you. And, and were you surprised? I mean, you've been in leadership positions, you know, different parts of you know, private and, you know, social services, as you mentioned, were you surprised about the inequities? In no, no, I wasn't surprised. I spent 10 years working in, uh, in an agency that supported people that had uh, intellectual disabilities in their families. So I saw the inequities every single day. And those in our social services industries, whether they were offering behavioral health services to children or adults, or they were offering um, addiction support services, both to children, adolescents and adults, we all saw this coming. And we had been saying for years and years that the safety net was fragile and it was fraying and that it had large holes in it through which people would fall should anything change, anything. We knew how fragile it was. So for those of us who've been working in this field for a very long time, it was not a surprise. It felt, it just made most of us very, very sad because had we all worked collectively to try to strengthen that safety net, we probably would not have seen the devastation, the economic and socioeconomic devastation that we saw in the nation. Now, the irony is that this is the richest country in the world. That's right. So what, what can we do moving forward, you know, in your experience that can oh help? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> where do we begin? Where well, do we begin? It's, where do we yes, begin? Yes. I, although the, we are the richest nation in the world, I think we know that most of that wealth is held by very, very few people. And I think it's that economic inequity that continues to really uh, be, I guess, more widely known by a lot of people and continues to create the inequality that we see. So there are a few things. We know that people have often talked about creating different tax structures so that there's more fairness in the way that taxes are paid and the ways in which they are distributed. 
There's also been discussion about changing the way in which public school systems are funded because they're primarily funded based on the community in which you live. But if your community doesn't have a lot of resources, then you're limited exactly. to the access and the quality of education that you get. I think there are a number of ways. Those are just two in particular that I think we can really try to think differently about how we do things. The last thing I would say about that is that for a very long time, social service organizations have had to raise enormous amounts of money to do their work. And the manner in which they use that money and the accountability that they have to have for that money leaves them feeling very constrained as to what they can do. So I would say to funders, foundations, private donors, it's time to rethink how that partnership works so that social service agencies can do broader work, more expansive work, and uh, really more innovative work to try to help people live better lives and not wait until desperation strikes in order to then think creatively and innovatively about how people can be helped and served. Right, and, and it, one of the things as you were talking about this is how is it that we feel comfortable leaving people behind? Yes. All right, because you know, if we if we build stronger communities, we should be able to exchange goods and services, and you know, both intellectual resources and human resources, etc., to really benefit everyone in the community. It used That's to be right. that way. If I, if you know, I'm uh, thinking right. At least you know, from the community I come from in Ghana. You know, that is the way it functioned. Not everyone lives at the same level, right? That is impossible. But right. everyone within the community is also seen as a respected member of the community. Yes. You know, and that they yes. also have a role to play in order for everyone to be successful. Right. That's right. right. So. But it's very different here in the United States. It, it is a country of rugged individualism. Right. So while, you may have, <laughs> and that's, that has been the culture for many, many, many years, right? for, for centuries. So it's, it's hard, I think, for a lot of us to wrap our minds around the idea that we are, we are collectively responsible for one another. We often hear those who have very strong libertarian beliefs that they want to just be able to take care of themselves and that others should be able to do the same. But we know, we know this based on our country's history that work. not everyone has access to the same opportunity in order exactly. to be able to do that. Exactly. So while it may seem like it's a wonderful ideal, in, in many ways, it's a very easy way for people to be left behind. And then when you combine that with the, with the idea that we've, we've seen very unfortunately, very recently, there are many people who believe that not all people are equal based on their gender, their race, where they live, what they do. There are ways that people create, and humans do this, they create these hierarchies that create separation. And therefore, there's inherent inequality in the way that people are uh, perceive themselves to be different from others. There are, there are, and my family's from Guyana, and, and again, there's the sense of community, you take care of one another, and that's the way that it works. But that's not always the same everywhere. And I think it's, it's harder for us to grasp that as we live farther away from our families and that sense of community is lost. Now, as we were talking about that, I was gonna dive into you being the chief executive officer of the Paid Family and Medical Leave Insurance Authority. And I was thinking about this earlier today that paid family and medical leave is essential to everyone, right? It doesn't have to be a political thing, but we see that some of these discussions create separation again. You know, in, um, there are some who are for it and those who are against it um, create this narrative that makes it look like the other people who benefit from it are not um, deserving of that reward or, yeah, let me say, you know, the, the, the insurance or the payments that they get are uh, not deserved. How would you shed light on this for everyone to understand? Well, I, I think you've articulated it perfectly. We, the, I think most of the pushback that we get and the objections that people have um, are twofold. We hear from business owners, especially very small business owners that, 
many of their staff will take time off all at the same time, perhaps not all for legitimate reasons, and that will leave their businesses crippled. And then on the other hand, we hear that there's just an inherent mistrust in the way that people will either access the benefit or take advantage of it. And that's, uh, that's just inherent in the way government programs work. And it, it's just typical of the way that we create waste, fraud, and abuse in government programs. And I would say two things. Uh, one, there isn't an entitlement program that you can think of, whether it's social security, workers' compensation, disability insurance, mm -hmm. Where there are humans, and I've said this quite often, mm -hmm. there will be humans who will try to find a way to access something that does not belong to them. Um, <laughs> that, that's that, true. that is human. That is nature. true. That's a human nature, right? That's right. That, that's <laughs> human nature. So it is a completely unrealistic expectation to think that no one will even attempt, much less um, maybe one or two people or a small number will be successful at that. And we are doing the best that we can to make sure that there's prevention. And, and if that uh, fraud does occur, that there's an, an immediate correction of that. But that doesn't mean that the vast majority of people who are paying into this fund and right. accessing this benefit don't need it. It is not a black and white assessment. It is not an all or nothing proposition. And that's how I respond to it. Then I often hear people tell me, I'm paying into this fund and I'll never use it. And I say, I really hope you're right. Because if you need it, something in your life has, it is either joyful, you're having a child, right. or something has really gone wrong. Um, or you just have, or you're just going through the natural phases of life, and this is a need that you have. So I do hope that things go well for you, and you don't have to access it. But I hope even more that when you do need it, you, you won't begrudge care. anyone else exactly. having it, and you'll have it too. Well, the benefit is, you know, it's not a race issue. It's not a, um, it, you know, it, it benefits everyone. It doesn't have to be it's not only democrats that you know benefit from this um and it's not saying that you know if you're a republican you can't access this benefit you have a family and god forbid as you mentioned um things happen to people that you can never ever anticipate you know that you may have a child in the family and, and a newborn that may end up in a hospital god forbid you know, you might go through some challenges that you cannot plan for. This is a benefit that, you know, everyone can really take advantage of. And it's good if we have it in place than if we're not, you know, we don't have at all. As we have seen in the recent uh, months in the past, we even with our resources as a wealthy nation, a lot of things fell into the cracks where That's we couldn't right. take care of our citizens when they got ill. That's right. With COVID. That's right. And as much as we like to decry social service supports and we call it welfare and that we create dependencies on people, we saw what happened in COVID. The need was so dire and so great and so expensive that our federal government had to stand up and create what was then known as the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which provided payment and time off for families to attend to their loved ones who had been affected by COVID when schools closed, when daycares, when daycare closed, and when other people were being devastated by the disease. So that was a national recognition that this need is really great. And in a way, it's a shame that it took a, a, a virus that was taking people's lives by the hundreds of thousands for us to realize that this was really a, a long standing need. But in other ways, it really did bring into very sharp relief why this particular program is so important. We've had over 8,000 people apply for benefits so far for pregnancy and bonding and being able to care for their own serious health conditions. And the stories that we hear, uh, some of them are very joyful and some of them are really heartbreaking. People who've waited two years to have surgery because they couldn't afford to take time from work and be away. And now they're able to take care of themselves and some suffering will be relieved as a result of that. And that's a good thing. It is a wonderful thing, especially, you know, what do we work for if we can't take care of our families? That's right. Right. That's right. Um, that, that is something that I think we should all reflect on when we're thinking of who gets what within the social services system, right? Yes. That we should all yes. be able, especially with how hard we work in this country, be able mm. to take care of our families. 
Yes. And I think that's all we really want in the end is to be able to take care of our families. Right. And some of us can take care of our families in a, in a very rich way. And some of us, it's much more modest. But when your children come to you or your parents come to you and they need something, whether it's uh, financial support or emotional support or physical support, then none of us wants to say no. And that's why this program is, I think, just so revolutionary because it allows us to say yes, that we can come to your aid and support and we can also support ourselves while we have the dignity of recovering from an illness exactly. and then returning to our work. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, I notice also that you've worked with uh, people with disabilities, intellectual and otherwise. Could you shed some light on that? Sure. I spent 10 years at an agency uh, called HARC in Hartford, supporting people with intellectual disabilities and their families. When I started, I knew nothing about people with intellectual disabilities, but I loved every moment that I was there. When you work with people with disabilities, it teaches you how to be an advocate in ways that you would have never imagined. People with intellectual disabilities are often marginalized. People often don't take their capabilities seriously and they don't have the degree of respect that they deserve and they're not shown the dignity that they deserve as human beings. They show up in our world differently, but that doesn't mean that they're yeah, less any now. less entitled right. Right, to, to respect and dignity. And I would see the small indignities happen. For example, I would bring a, a, a participant to look at an apartment because they were ready to live on their own. And we would have the conversation by phone and then we'd arrive with our client and all of a sudden the apartment's no longer available. Or we would go to, to a doctor's office and while I'm talking with, I'm bringing the participant with me, they're perfectly capable of explaining what's wrong with them or how they're feeling, but the caregiver would speak to me or the, the healthcare provider would speak to me or the person who brought them as opposed to speaking to the person themselves. So it's those small and large indignities that would happen. So I was really, I felt so proud and so grateful to have had the opportunity to, to be an advocate for all of the years that I did that work. It's really, it was really transformational and life-changing for me. As you were talking about it, I remember um, I had worked in a group home some ancient years ago, and you know, I loved the clients that we had there. And there was a Polish gentleman that, um, you know, was so delightful. Uh, yes, he, he played the accordion and etc. And uh, there was one time I, you know, because of him. I learned a lot about Polish words, you know, I like languages, et cetera. So I learned a lot of Polish words, but I also learned about their meals and stuff. So when they were having Polish festivals and he wanted to go, I would accompany him. And yeah. most of the, I think 90% of the time I took him out, I was the only black person in the <laughs> That's very possible. <laughs> I certainly had that experience too. <laughs> you know, I, I was the only black person there, but it didn't matter. I, you know, and some that's right. Capusta and you know, kielbasa and all that kind of yes, stuff. So, yes, yes, yes. And it was it was a fun experience. I wouldn't have done it otherwise, right? But that's right. Through him, I, I got right. to know a lot more, and you yes. know, he broadened my mind in ways that I, you know, and I, hoping that people listening to this conversation would understand that we are all here by grace, right? Yes. We're all being um, given gifts that we share with others. That's and right. irrespective of where a person is in their life station, it's still by grace, right? And That's if we right. were to open our hearts, you know, we would really learn a thing or two Absolutely. From Absolutely. all quarters. Um, From all quarters. The other thing I learned working with people with intellectual disabilities is that um, communication happens in many different ways. There were many people who were nonverbal, but we would have lovely exchanges. There was one man in particular, I remember uh, Patrick, who was completely dependent on everyone around him for all of his activities of daily living, and he also couldn't speak. But we would uh, exchange. I would have conversation with him 
And then, you know, he, we would, he would tell, I would tell a joke and he would laugh or he'd give me a look like that joke wasn't funny. And we're right. <laughs> having these conversations. And, you know, or he'd have these wonderful facial expressions. And I would say, Patrick, stop being so fresh. I know what that means. And he'd look away like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> right. It, it was wonderful. It really taught you to just really appreciate, appreciate exactly. human nature in, exactly. in every person that comes your way. And it comes in so many different ways, right? And, and they're so um, intelligent with so many different things that we could not even fathom on That's right. learning how to do it, right? That's right. Um, but I don't know how we came to this place of seeing certain things as just being the right way yes yes you know i don't know either i don't i don't know where this rigidity came from i i don't understand where this specific definition of being an american or being human or being a woman or being a person of color came mm -hmm. from but it, its stridency is frightening to me. It is. <laughs> it really is. It is, it is because it, it's so limiting in the way that people can define themselves. And it's limiting in, in a way that's somewhat dangerous in the way that people feel that they can define one another and apply really not only just uh, baseless stereotypes, but really dangerous qualities to other people based on their understanding of who they should be. And it just creates more of a distance between us and as we live together. And that's to it's sort of the answer to the question you were asking me earlier. Well, you know, why is it that we can't find a way to care for one another? Because I think we spend more time trying to figure out how we're different from one another rather than spending time figuring out what we have in common and how we can support one another in our common goals of, of living lives with dignity and inclusion. And we are um, more alike than not. Right. Um, Absolutely. I, I would tell you, as a black woman, uh, an immigrant, <laughs> and you are an immigrant, you know, too. So this this conversation is going to be interesting, and I promise you, I won't get you in trouble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually not an immigrant. My, my brothers and I, and some of my cousins, were all first generation Americans. Okay. All right. Yes, but um, but being raised by parents who were immigrants, it is a very different experience. Yes. Um, right, you very know, different we can, we can experience. share stories about that. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of expectations. Yes. <laughs> no excuses. Oh my right. goodness, no excuses. And no. you know, one thing I can say is they did not indulge our foolishness. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. As, as a black woman in this country and i can share some in in leadership positions i would say and i remember i was at a, a harmony conference um last year and somebody asked me so what has my experience been you know coming to this country and i thought oh my god do you really want me to go there because you know when i lived outside this country coming in i had a whole different view of what yes um the promise of this country and really if we were to make an effort you know in really establishing some of the principles and that idea that this place would be just i i don't even know what word to use but mm. you know it, it would just broaden the human spirit in ways that we cannot um fathom yeah then the realities of this place uh can be shocking mm. and and my experience i think you know it hasn't been all bad right. but it has been um very challenging some disappointing and mm -hmm. to a point where I had, a, I was in a workplace where I think I had PTSD from, mm -hmm. suffered PTSD. It was that mm -hmm. traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And it was strange to see people you weaponize so mm -hmm. many things to get other people in trouble. Yes. And as a black woman, you know, running my own department and, um the staff i had oh my god um yeah it, it, it was it was that bad yeah. now you are in leadership you have been through that same 
uh, cycle, you know, being in leadership positions and as well as um, working with a broad scope of people. Yes. What, based on your experiences, what can you share with others heading in that same direction? Yes. Um, I would say that like many people of color, that my parents taught me that I needed to be much better, right? That you, we always know the twice as good rule as we call it, that I had to be twice as smart, my grades had to be twice as good, I had to be twice as, uh, twice as um, good as everyone else in order to just be perceived as being competent. Mm -hmm. And so when you combine that, as you said, with the unrelenting expectations of immigrant parents, it really does place a lot of pressure on you to always be excellent. But I, I don't know if I ever really succumbed to that pressure, but I had worked in environments that I think were um, much more demanding than others, but demanding in ways that really I, that weren't always necessary in order to get the excellence, uh, the excellent outcomes that they were seeking. And this is true for certain professions, doctors, lawyers. Uh, you know, I have a friend who um, is, she's now uh, you know, a very successful physician, but when she was a resident, she said, Andrea, this is a profession that eats as young. That's just what it does. It's, a, it's just right. about devouring people you know, <laughs> in the early stages of their career. And those that survive are the ones that, that end up descending. And there's a lot, there's really, there's a very strong argument to be made that in, in many instances, that's just not necessary in order to get people to really be at their best. And it, it's just, a, it, it is, I think, a dysfunctional tradition that some professions have engaged in for so long and they, they just don't have any way of learning how to uh, behave differently. But I certainly have had my fair share of discrimination. I, I, there are times when I very often, I was a, an attorney, a practicing attorney for quite some time and I would show up in court and I, I, there were you know, sometimes jurists that I would encounter that would not let me in the courtroom because I had to wait for my lawyer to arrive because there wasn't any thought that maybe I, I could you possibly could be, be a lawyer. Yes, right. Right. <laughs> I could possibly be the attorney waiting for my client to show up who may or may not be the same race as me. And, right. so, and that has often happened. And, you know, and I've worked in a couple of large law firms where, where clients have come in and this is long before the internet was a, a place where you could go and identify people before you met them. Uh, and, you know, I, I would be mistaken for the receptionist or the secretary and, and I'd be sent off to fetch coffee and newspapers and right. which was disrespectful in two ways because the, because a woman shows up, she's not there to fetch your coffee and newspapers. Okay, so exactly. let's, let's just deal with the gender <laughs> issue right then, right? right? You can go get your own, first of all. And then second, this presumption that the person of color who shows up could not possibly be the professional that you will be engaging in is mm -hmm. doubly insulting. So if you'll indulge me, I will tell this very short story. I was, no, I was at HARC, it was the CEO, and the security person calls and says, someone would like to speak with you, but she's looking for your assistant, Cynthia. So, well, Cynthia isn't here right now, but I'll come down to see what they need. So I descend from the elevator and the person starts saying, Cynthia, so I'm wearing a badge that is unmistakably large with my <laughs> name on it. It's clearly not Cynthia. And he just continues to speak to me. Well, you know, as, as soon as you see Andrea, let me know because then, and, and, and the, the guard behind me, the, the security guard is saying, this isn't going to end well for you. This isn't going to end well for you. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, that's not Cynthia. This is not going to end well for you. So I let her continue and she gave me her business card. And then I went back to my desk and, and I called her office and I asked to speak to her supervisor. And I said, this, this is what happened. And clearly she had a perception that the woman of color who stepped off the elevator had to be the assistant and there was no way really? she could possibly be the leader. And I said, and I, I think you need to do some training because that, that can't happen again. They were deeply embarrassed and profusely apologetic, but certainly that happens because so many of the times that people have, absolutely. So many times, you know, that it's almost unending. And yes. It, it's so frequent that it, yes. it's tiring, you know, that apart from the challenges that we face in the workplace, trying to be the best you can be, and actually always putting your best foot forward, right. you know, but, and, and I don't want to make this sound um, more difficult than it is, <laughs> uh, but, you know, just expressing that this is out there and a lot of black women go through this yes how can we 
help? How can we support one another in, in, in this? Um, I want to say, you know, depressing sometimes, uh, because I know a lot of Black women that feel the same way that I do. Yes. And yet we get up every day and we're very strong in the way we just day after day go through these challenges, right? And still do right. well. And, and right. so what message do we pass on to the younger ones coming along? Mm. I would say to the younger ones, continue to persevere, but don't do it alone. Mm -hmm. Definitely build a network of like-minded women who will support you as you ascend and progress throughout your career. The other thing I would tell them is that in every workplace, unless it is a completely toxic workplace that you, you believe you must leave, find not only a mentor, but a champion. And there is a difference. I mean, your champion, your mentor may give you general advice on how to succeed in the organization. Your champion is going to stand up for you and say you are worthy of the investment that the organization needs to make in you in order for you to succeed. And your champions are very important. And they often, they can emerge naturally. You may do an excellent job for someone. And then all of a sudden, that's, that's not only your mentor and your champion, and sometimes they're one in the same. But I can tell you in those very challenging environments in which I worked, I had one or the other or both. And I kept in touch with them as I, as I, even if I left the organization and moved on, because those are the people that really believe in you and your talent and your ability. And I coupled that with a very tight knit group of women I still have a relationship with and we support each other every day. That, that I think is probably the best way to have a consistent approach to supporting yourself, to be able to commiserate, to have a reality or sanity check when you when sometimes things happen that you can't even believe have occurred right. so that you can get a different perspective and you can be validated, which is what we often don't get in the workplaces where we are. We don't get that validation. Exactly. And, and one of the things that comes to mind also is that some of these champions uh, could be allies, you know, in, in your work and they don't have to be of a particular race. Um, That's right. You know, they could be just allies and people who have an understanding of what we go through and can help in some shape or form yes. to really make, balance things out a little bit so you don't feel all alone and isolated. That's right. right? That's right. Is there a network we could all kind of um, join? I'm trying to <laughs> form um, with my conversations and podcast mm. and also form a community on Patreon so that, you know, people looking mm -hmm. for some type of support can join and, you know, be part of something, a group, have discussions, conversations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that, you know, there are several others out there that people could look up, you know, mm -hmm. search or ask around, you know, that they could use as a channel to support their well-being. Yes. I don't belong to a particular group anymore. I was very active in a lot of trade associations. So I was, I, as I said, I'm, I'm an attorney by training. So I was active in the Connecticut Bar Association. But the Bar Association also, there's a corollary. There's the George W. Crawford Black Bar Association. And I found a lot of support there. And many professions have a uh, a, a black membership association, whether it's black MBAs or nurses or social workers, mm -hmm. those are always great places to go to, to find allies and to find support. And as I mentioned before, um, validation. And then, you know, as you get older, there are other organizations you can belong to. So I belong to the, the Links Incorporated, and I've found that there's a lot of support that's there, but that's usually in the later stages of your career. But I, I really do encourage young women to be become very active not only in the sort of the majority trade associations in their uh, in their profession, but also you know seek out those women who uh, with whom you have that special affinity of uh, race and gender, so that you can get the support that you need. Yeah, and you know they can start just by asking, right? right. And then you know it will lead to a conversation, a relationship. Etc. that would expand their world. Yes. Bit, right? That's right. We all need that. We all need that. Absolutely. Um, now, I know you have been recognized for 
a lot of things. Um, if I may list, or you can share some, you know, the ones that mean most to you. Oh my goodness. I, so the one that means the most to me is being named to the list of 100 women of color mm -hmm. in the, sort of the New England region. I uh, had always admired the other women who had made that list. They were, they were just phenomenal women who had accomplished a lot. And I never saw myself as one of those women. And so the, the year that I was nominated and the name, that really for me just was so, in, it, was, it was an amazing uh, recognition and I was very humbled and grateful. And then uh, last year I was named one of the uh, 100 most influential blacks in Connecticut by the NAACP. That was a complete surprise. I received an email from a name that I didn't recognize, which is not uncommon in my work. And then I thought it, it was yet another person railing against paid leave, but I get lots, <laughs> I get lots of those emails and I, read, I do read them all. I said, okay, this person's unhappy. And then I opened it and I was, I was really, really thrilled, really thrilled uh, to be recognized by such a venerated uh, uh, organization for the work that I had done on behalf of all people. So th those two really meant the most to me. That's wonderful. And, you know, congratulations on that. I see you really, you know, uh, climbing up and, and it's, it's, I'm so proud, you know, to Thank have you. Yeah, Thank you. I'm so, so proud of that. And, you know, uh, Sonia, into, you know, mentioned you to me. You and yes. I have not met before. Uh, no. this, this is our first, but I want to say this um, from the moment, and it hasn't been that long since we connected, uh, moment we connected to now as we're speaking, everything went smoothly. Yes. And that is, that is power right there. You know, that's just, right. That's power that's right. right there. So moving forward, and, and you know, I, as I say, when I start these conversations, usually it looks like we're going to, it, you know, it looks like it's going to be long, you know, whatever. And we're, right. we're almost an hour in already, uh, which is uh, wonderful. I That's amazing. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So what is your vision for women Yes. in action? You know, what can we do? I say that love is action yes. all the time, right? And if yes. we have love for each other, then we must be doing certain things to them either our work, communities, relationships, friendships, et cetera. Um, yes. So what are your visions? My vision for women is for them to live their lives, pursuing whatever they desire, without any barriers, with, without, uh, you know, any, um, without any hesitation that they are fully deserving of all of the things that they want in their lives that they are able at no matter what age they are to step fully into every talent and gift they've ever been given to be the very best that they can be as they define it for themselves. So is that being a mother? Is it being a partner? Is it being a wife? Is it being an executive? Is it being a community leader? Is it being a lay minister? Is it, is it being a, a, an, an ordained minister? It doesn't matter what it is. You should be empowered to define what happiness is for you what your life mission is, and to be able to pursue that really without any limitation. I wish that for so many women, many women yes. so many, every woman I see, I wish that for her at every stage in her life, no matter what that is. Right. And, and as you were saying that, you know, living authentically, right, is yes. to really step into the things we love and be able to express that in however yes. way we see fit for us, right? That's right. And it's not depending on what society, you know, defines as the norm. Correct. Right? Because Correct. our quirkiness or, you know, sometimes we feel like, oh, we are the odd ones out. But that odd um, personality is a gift. It is. You know, it, it, it is. It is. But we're never encouraged to lean into that gift, right? We're, we're always encouraged to conform, women in particular. We're encouraged exactly. to conform. We're not encouraged to be unique. We're not in, encouraged to embrace our quirkiness or our idiosyncrasies because that makes us who we are. And I would love to see women live with the freedom, you know, not bounded by 
the definitions that of, of how our gender should behave that's been imposed on us. Yes, we can do that. anything and we should be able to have the ability to at least explore that possibility. You know, one of the things, and you know, I used to get in trouble a lot when I was a kid because there was so many things I didn't want to do, you know, like um, because I'm a girl or something, you know, so I broke all the rules. Um, yes which got me in trouble. I would climb trees and play soccer with the boys. I just wanted to know what it felt like. It's just right. like, you know, you can't do certain things. But one thing that persistently occurs, and it doesn't matter race, anything, all women go through this, challenges. Yeah. And that we, not in our careers, in our relationships, in our with our you know, spouse and there are certain things that have been you know, almost defined, you cannot do, you're breaking the rules, et cetera. Mm. But mm. if you don't feel fulfilled in any relationship, I think there has to be a second take and you know, take a deep look and see whether it works or it's not working. And if it's not working, where can you go to find the resources that can help you step out? Right. right. Yeah. I, those resources exist in different places and it depends on where you are and there. Right. And some of them are richer in other areas and not as much in, in, in some places in the country and not as much in others. And, but I will say this though, it takes enormous courage to even have that level of self-examination and then even more courage to feel like you can do something about it. Because not only are we not encouraged often as women to, uh, to really acknowledge who we are in our authenticity, we're often punished for that. And then we are, we are told that we're not behaving as expected by really wanting to live our lives fully and authentically. But I think we can often find that sometimes in just one person in our life who, who validates our view of our, our, our dissatisfaction or, or our desire to want more for our lives, not necessarily even being dissatisfied where we are, but knowing that there's this desire to want to do more and to be more and to, and to step deeper into who it is that we were meant to be. And somehow when you have that desire and you articulate it and you believe in it, sometimes those resources come together in ways that you may have never imagined to bring you exactly where you need to be. Which I think brings me to what I think is the power base or foundation to our well-being and that each person having a spiritual practice, right? Yes. Because that is where the courage comes from. That is where you really can dive so deep and really find you within yes. and then bring it out. Right? That's right. So I think every guest I've had has had a view about what spiritual practice means to them. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share yours? I would. I have an unapologetic, deep and abiding belief in God. And I've never... It's been with me since I can remember as a very, very young girl. I always believed that there was a power greater than me. And I didn't necessarily grow up in a family that was particularly religious. As a matter of fact, my father was an atheist, an avowed atheist, almost up until the time that he died. Uh, and he lived to be 85. And, and it was only when he became very ill that he then began to acknowledge that there was a, a, a high, or, or at least begin to believe there was a higher power. So my spiritual practice is one where I spend quiet time in meditation in connection with the God as I believe the God to be. Mm -hmm. uh, reading, I, I'm a, I am a Christian, so I'm a Bible reader. And I recognize that's not the same for everyone. So I am a Bible reader. And then just spending very quiet time in meditation and being led to what I think is the next opportunity for me or getting guidance around what I should be doing in my life. And I have to say that I've never been disappointed in doing that. Mm -hmm. I have, um, I, I, I certainly don't impose my beliefs on anyone else, but my belief has always been my guiding post in my life. And, and I have to say, I've had some incredibly joyous experiences and I've had some terrible losses and terrible experiences. And throughout all of that, the constant that I've had is, is knowing that that spiritual connection that I have with what I believe is my creator has sustained me and strengthened me through every 
every challenge and journey in my life. That is so beautiful. Now, it is, and I bring this up not to, you know, tell people how to do it, but to let them recognize that there is a, a theme that emerges from spiritual practice for everyone. We all do it differently. Um, some people, you know, prefer the religious approach, some spiritual approach. It doesn't matter. There are so many paths that lead to God or to that central place of power, that unique right. place that we all should experience whilst we are on this journey and this life path, right? Right. So I, it, it, is, it is important and I think it is a powerful place to be when mm -hmm. you can really surrender because it gives you that privilege of surrendering, you know, yes. all your cares and yeah. let somebody just carry you for a moment and right. really just be free. You know, yes. because the weight can be heavy sometimes, as Very you much mentioned, so. you know, you go through losses and uh, sometimes the challenges are unending mm -hmm. and it feels like you can never get out of something. But if you are able to find that place within your heart and be able to go there and really stay silent, Mm -hmm. And listen, and I know Rumi has a lot of beautiful quotes about this, oh, yeah. that, you know, um, yeah. being silent, you know, is not just being alone or taking yourself away from something, but that is where you hear your inner voice That's right. giving you some clarity around some issue or mm -hmm. being in a place of contentment you know, just mm -hmm. peace or being uplifted, you know, when you are down. Um, yeah, I can go on on this for a little bit. <laughs> so, and I think you, you and I can do this for a while. Um, That's quite true. But, you know, our time is almost here. And I want to ask you, who is a woman of power and grace? I invited mm -hmm. you here because I believed you are. And, oh, you know, thank you for this. I mean, I'm looking at everything and and I'm really, really proud, you know, to thank know you. you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. There are, I'm so fortunate to know so many women who I believe are women of power and grace. And I think the one that really comes to mind is um, she's one of my closest and dearest friends. Her name is Melanie Gutierrez. And uh, so I am, an, I am an adoptive parent, which is a different journey than many women have had. And, and some of the loss that I spoke of had to do with the loss of my children when they were infants. And she, she showed up for me in ways that um, even some in my family found difficult to do. And she did it by meeting me where I was, never trying to move my grief along just sometimes sitting with me and just, just letting me sit in the depth of my grief and, and carrying me and holding me sometimes until I could find my way to a better place. And she did it uh, with such love and kindness and no judgment. And I am always incredibly grateful to her for that. So it doesn't, the women that we know, they don't have to be famous and yeah. be world renowned and write and be authors. If I had to name a woman of power and grace, it is my friend, Melanie. Well, I want to say, and I just got chills. So I want to say this, you know, and I hope you should get a chance to listen that the divine sends angels, you know, yes. to all of us in many different ways. And um, she did that for you. And that is wonderful in acknowledging the beauty that this life holds. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. And it I is my pleasure it. and it's my honor to be here. Thank you. And I'll see all our listeners in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you.